two to win. Gapto's going to push from Tony. They've got to go. It's going to throw. It's going to go to the keepers in. He's got it. And you have won the World Cup by the barest of margins. By the barest of all margins. Absolute ecstasy for England. Technicolor, the man who called that final ball in the World Cup final. And to my mind, he's the best commentator in world sport, actually, not just <laughs> world cricket. So, Sir Ian D D D D Stockley Smith, you are our special guest tonight. Thank you for joining us. Welcome you. to what we call the world's best cricket club and we have the world's best cricket commentator in it. Well, I'm very, very honoured that you say those kind words about me, Simon. And I know that you say it with a clenched fist that I can't see. Uh, but uh, it's a special pleasure for me to join Simon Mann, actually. I've, I've, I've known Simon, I've listened to Simon over the years. So um, this is a real honour. And uh, if you just sit in the background and then I'm sure Simon Mann and I can have quite a good little chat. If, if bullshit were made of rubber, you'd bounce to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, welcome to everyone else here as well. And then we've got some new guests uh, tonight. Uh, thank you for joining our club, worldsbestcricketclub.com. Keep telling your friends about it because we are getting high quality guests like, well, tonight, hopefully. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining. It is, of course, in aid of the Professional Cricketers Trust. So most of your money, apart from a little bit of expenses and about 2,000 quid to Ian Stockley Smith, uh, goes to the charity. So thank you very much for your support. And well, we'll start with uh, Smithy, what time of day it is and in New Zealand and what are you doing today? Well, I'm uh, waking up to a, it's a beautiful morning here in uh, Hawke's Bay where I live, uh, central part of the North Island. And uh, look, today uh, we wake up and just hope that there's no COVID news overnight. We were in uh, stages of lockdown earlier in the week. So we just hope that heading into the weekend, we've got a basically a COVID-free weekend where we can just get on. Auckland, uh, uh, our biggest city, of course, is, is in what we call level two, which means they've got certain restrictions, like you can only have a crowd of 100 and yeah, you've got to do social distance and wear masks on certain occasions and things. So, But uh, down in Hawke's Bay, we've been very, very lucky, uh, fellas. So uh, we, we just get on normally, actually. So Today, I'll, you know, after I've done this, I'll do the usual 10K run, followed by um, I'll probably swim probably a kilometre, and uh, and then I've just bought a new bike, which you'll be interested to know, so I'll, I'll probably be out on the roads for about an hour as well. So just a standard morning. In, in your dreams. You'll have a large yeah. breakfast and probably watch a bit of telly and then go for a gentle stroll to the end of the garden and back and then have a lie down. Is that right? <laughs> it's closer to the, the, my story, yeah. <laughs> a bit of golf, though, maybe? Is I golf played this, golf yesterday. Last yesterday. night was your golf day, yeah. Yeah, yeah. horribly. Uh, no good at all. So um, I've got to rectify that in the next uh, in the next seven days before I play again. But uh, look, uh, that's one of the things I've got back into. I, I mean, I'm not commentating cricket in ha at home. So I've actually had what I'd call a, a normal people summer in New Zealand. So uh, I first started playing first class cricket back in 1975. And I've either played over the Christmas New Year period or commentated over the Christmas New Year period. So it's effectively my first summer off where I do what normal people do uh, in 45 years. So I've been to the beach, uh, I've played golf with my mates, I've been to a few race meetings uh, and just had a, a pretty generally lazy sort of summery time, which is, I've, I've had FOMO, I've missed cricket commentary. There's no, I, I can't lie about that. Uh, but I've also seen the other side, which is also quite enjoyable. It's probably worth explaining uh... Smithy, why you're not commentating? It seems extraordinary uh, to people over here, having you know heard that World Cup final commentary and the and the semi final commentary as well, and heard you for many years, you know here, there, and everywhere. Why you're not commentating in New Zealand? Well, Simon, uh, like you, you have in England, uh, we've never really had 
uh, a competitive situation for rights, cricket rights in this country. I mean, Sky have had it unopposed for around 21 years. Uh, all of a sudden, a new player came into the market, uh, a telecom company by the name of Spark, and they bid very successfully just after the Cricket World Cup uh, and outbid Sky in terms of uh, what they were prepared to pay. And uh, they won the rights. So I'm contracted to Sky, long-term contracted to Sky, which means um, I was out. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, I've, I found it quite sad. Um, I can't do anything at home. I'm still able to travel and do it, but of course COVID has, has restricted all travel and all world competitions. So hopefully when the, the vaccines, et cetera, kick in and, and we can get on top of this horrible thing, um, I'll be able to commentate, but certainly won't be commentating in New Zealand unless they're events that are governed by the ICC. How has that gone down in New Zealand? I bet they're absolutely well, delighted. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess so. It's, it's probably a mixed bag. There was, there was a bit of uh, where's it going to be? Because at the same time, of course, you'll appreciate they changed the radio rights as well over here, uh, Simon, and Brian Waddle and Jeremy Coney were removed as well. So... All of a sudden, you know, the three, three or four of the voices that they'd been used to, um, the view, cricket viewers over here, uh, for so long, it disappeared just like that. And uh, so there was a backlash. But like everything, you know, once people realise that their backlash is not going to change anything, it sort of goes quiet. And we just, we just, uh, they just moved on. And um, I can confidently say that there's not as many people uh, watching cricket on television in New Zealand as there was last year. I, I know that for a fact. Because Which is a shame because New, Zeal I mean, New Zealand are doing so well at the moment as well. Yeah, well, it's harder to get. Spark is a, as a, as I say, as an internet-based company. Or we, if you know New Zealand, you know that a lot of areas of New Zealand are unpopulated. They're rural areas, but you know, uh, a lot of areas also uh, have people that you know, farmers, etc., which are big sport followers. But they can't get it because they haven't got fast net fibre running past their letterbox. So a lot of areas people can't get it. A lot of older people haven't got the wherewithal or the, the desire actually to get onto computers and, and fire away and try and find things and signals. So uh, I'm estimating that probably a third of the people that at the moment, first year in, probably about a third of the people watching um, cricket in New Zealand um, compared to this time last year. Having said that, uh, Sky have got, we've got the rights to Australian cricket. So all, all of comes in on Sky. So this year we've had that absorbing Australia-India series to counter what's going on in New Zealand. And next year, of course, we've got the Ashes. So, you know, it's right. not like Sky's out of the picture. It's just that we're not doing domestic cricket. So just, just to clarify this, you can't go to your sort of TV console and <laughs> press a button and it comes on like you normally would. You have to actually sort of, uh, I don't know, do something on your computer and, and stream it onto your television. Is that right? That's correct. Or you can stream it onto your phone or you can, you know, you can watch it. There are upsides to it, of course. It's a little bit more accessible in certain areas, but not to the bulk of New Zealanders. And um, it, it's a package as well. It's pay-per-view. So, you know, you, you have to buy, uh, I think it's about a $20 a month type package to watch the cricket. They're a bit unlucky, New Zealand cricket, this time round. We had a depleted West Indies side come here, which New Zealand mopped up. And a Pakistan side that uh, had COVID problems where they were, you know, where they were breaking the rules and threatened to go home. So uh, it was a bit ugly. Uh, and then, of course, they were up against this great series in, in Australia where India played out of their skins to knock over the Aussies. So it was just, it, it's been a, an unfortunate year for them. They're going to finish uh, on a relatively high note with five T20s against Australia starting next week. Uh, with bearing in mind, of course, that the the, world, the T20 World Cup should go ahead at some stage in the future. Mm. Yeah, God, uh, do you think it's a mistake? Actually, I mean, is it? I, I felt when I mean, I knew you were you were heavily involved with Channel Four, obviously, in two thousand and five, and you saw what happened then when everything went to Sky, and um, it, it caused that caused a backlash. And I don't think it's ever really quite recovered, funnily enough. Um, although people have got more used to the situation now. What, what about and, and I always felt actually that 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 deal that was done in 2000 was a bit premature because people weren't ready for the whole of it to go on to satellite TV and maybe they're not totally ready for the situation you've got now in New Zealand. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I was you're, you're right. I was there right from uh, the first year of Channel Four, but of course, you know, you'd, Channel Four had, had had bought it off a dynasty, you know. BBC. I mean, what was the reaction back for most English viewers who 
who just got you had BBC and and just obviously knew and then relied on those voices and all of a sudden are gone. So it happens, you know, it, it does happen. Uh, look, I. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's it, every time the rights come up now, it, it's a bit, it's a matter of money. And, and I don't under I don't blame New Zealand cricket or any cricket board for making sure that the financial side of the thing is is uh, in place. But I do think they've got a responsibility as well to the portrayal of the game uh, and how many how how far their reach is and how accessible it is to people. Um, and, and if they do that the right way, then the the game will look after itself. But if you, if you just go basically for the money and ask people to change the way they do things, then you're going to find some sort of backlash. You have to. Matthew Cleave says, how long is the contract for? Ah, right. OK, well, Matthew, it's five years at this point. So they're just uh, coming to the end of year one. Uh, I think they can review it after year two. Both parties can after year two. But... New Zealand cricket are, are trumpeting. They're uh, very happy with the way things are going. So look, um, I, I don't highlights see on I don't highlights see on another channel or anything. No, not really. Uh, the upside is uh, every now and then they play a game on free to air, like uh, over here it's TVNZ, Yoz, as you know, yeah. uh, as opposed to the BBC. So um, you know, every now and then they treat uh, fringe viewers and people that can't get it to um, a game that's on free to wear, but that's governed by network news and all sorts of things in terms of the timing. So it's not that relaxed. And, and you know, if, if, they, if they played a super over game that went into perhaps the network news at six o'clock, uh, God only knows what would happen there. I don't. I, I, I've got a record. I hold a record actually for commentating on a match in the World Cup in one country when I was in New Zealand and the World Cup was in Australia well, the part this match was. And not only was I not in the same country commentating on the game, but I wasn't in the room where the, 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 the television was either because New Zealand hadn't quite caught up with the rest of the world. We didn't have cordless phones. So it was a, a, a landline fixed to the wall with a cord about this long and the TV was in another room. So I had to get someone to watch the TV to tell me what was going on, relay it to me, and I'd be on the phone relaying it to London, to BBC Radio London. So I wasn't even, yeah, anyway, that's a, sort of a bit of a stupid aside, really, sorry. But I just thought it sort of it embodies the, the beautiful rusticness of New Zealand. I just love New Zealand. I, I, don't, I wonder how many people in our club have been there, actually, because, I mean, it is a special country. You're so lucky to... To be there, and you, you've got what about four COVID cases or something? Have you? We had uh, well, at the moment. I think we've got four. Uh, you probably know them 20... personally, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we've had twenty-five deaths. Yeah, it's um, extraordinary, isn't it? It's extraordinary only compared to hear what's going yeah, on. Yeah, um, we've you know we've lived the last I don't know the last. We, we were in lockdown the other day for three or four days, uh, three days. Uh, when I tell you lockdown, it didn't really mean we had to stay home. It was just that we couldn't do certain You haven't got things. any locks anyway in New Zealand, have you? Everything's open. <laughs> well, everything's open, Simon. Everything's open, except the borders. The borders are now, yeah. fair, well, I wouldn't say closed, but you've got to spend some time in cold it's before you're allowed in. So those T20 games that are coming up that you mentioned against yep. Australia, and, and England's women are there as well, aren't they? They're going to play some, uh, some matches against New Zealand women. Anyone can go, can they? It's like you know, it's free for all yep. in terms of crowds. Yep, Simon. On Monday, I think it'll, uh, the, the first one starts. And at this stage, if it was in Auckland, only a hundred people could go because they're on a different quality, but uh, different standard. But we now, uh, the rest of New Zealand, so south of Auckland, uh, yeah, they can have ten thousand there if they can squeeze them in. So, uh, yeah, situation normal. Amazing. Well, um, let's. Let's just wind the clock back a little bit um, to your playing career. And I know that's sort of, you know, black and white era, a bit like mine. But um, I've, I've dug out your record-breaking innings. All right, okay. About that. Can, you that tell us about, can you tell us a little bit about it before you see it? Okay, yeah. Um, Set well, the scene. Cause, so so we're, we're, basically, just, just to say... This man has the highest score of those anoraks on this club who, who aren't au fait with this stat. Um, this man has, holds the record for the highest score by a test match number nine. 
And how many was it? Uh, it's 173. Yeah. Astonishing. So we're, we're playing India at, um, at Eden Park and we lost the toss. They stuck us in. And at lunch, uh, we were six for 80, about six for 80. Shortly after lunch, uh, we were seven for 131. And that's when I joined Richard Hadley, seven for 131. And at the end of the day, we were, we were nine for 380. So it was, it was a bit of a turnaround in the afternoon. Uh, I, I went, Richard Hadley said, uh, I went out and he said, look, this is going all over the place. If you see one, it's in your zone, hit it. Because uh, I don't think either of us are here for very long. That's basically how he described and, and do you, do you recall just, the um, Indian attack, roughly? Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's probably not quite as good as uh, Jasper Bumrah, but uh, the great Kapil Dev was mm. in that attack. Um, Prabhaka, mm. uh, Atul Wasson. Atul Wasson, yeah. Yeah, Naranda Hawani. Yeah. So, you know, they were good enough to have us at 1.7 for 130, so at that point they were a pretty damn good attack, but... Uh, they, they lost a bit of fire and we had a bit of luck and Richard smashed 83, I think. Uh, and then when he got out, I had a, a really good partnership with Martin Sneddon, who just sat on his bat at the other end and, and defended. And then the great Danny Morrison came out. So we, we were able to we were able to withstand them and um, uh, they bowled in the right zones and I found them a reason. I mean, every dog has his day, doesn't he? And, and that, was, that was my day. So at the end of the day, I think I was 169 not out and I could see... John Wright in the tunnel, who was our captain at the time, just telling me to right towards the end of the day to you know, sort of settle down, settle down, because he wanted the option of the roller tomorrow, tomorrow morning. So he could, you know, and you have to be batting to do that, of course, back in those days. So um, he, he, he told me to settle down. I, I think I could have got close to, maybe got close to maybe 200 because it was just happening at that time. You know, and the next day you turn, you turn up and you can't hit it off the square. It's, it's just amazing how things can change. So I didn't last along the next day, but that was it. Yeah. And I well, let's, have a look at it. let's have a look at it. Shall okay. we? There's, yeah, a, there's sure. a few clips here and I'm sorry about the quality of the pictures, but this is the best I could do. It was New Zealand in the 19 early nineties. So, you know, it was lucky to have color really, weren't we? <laughs> A bit between the teeth, and that certainly worked today. That's a well timed stroke by Ian Smith, just forward of the square leg umpire. That'll go to the fence. Nicely whipped away by Smith. That's four. Put it away to the short, shortest boundary, just backward of square. Ian Smith gets into the act, and that'll be four runs to Smith. Smith has cracked this one away on the onside. That's gone again. Four more. Careful Dev now to Ian Smith on 33. And he gives this a decent heave away through the onside field. That's going out to the fence. Another boundary for Ian Smith. Wonderful eye, Ian Smith. Cracks it away. That'll be the half century. Ian Smith goes to 50 for the sixth time in Test cricket. Here's one on the offside. What a great shot. Look at that. 66 Ian Smith, 11 pause now. Without any disrespect to Richard Hadley, that would be the second best shot of the day. Prabhaka bowling to Ian Smith on 98. Spins it away. This could be it. It is it. Another Test 100 for Ian Smith. Look at all those boundaries. There's a couple on the offside. But most of them on the onside. Oh dear. That all was and has crashed. Oh, look at that. That's real minty stuff, isn't it? The records continue, continues to tumble. Smith goes again, and this time he might go over the top. Six runs. What a shot that was. I'd be very interested to look at the line of that. That looked as if it was on about middle. Where will this one go? It's gone anyway. And it's gone for six more. <laughs> 150 for Ian Smith. 
what an amazing performance. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've pick up on a few things there. Uh, <laughs> firstly, totally heartless. Poor old Atul Watson falls down, and all you can do is uh, pick his, 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 his next two balls for six. You no, <laughs> absolutely no sympathy for a poor bowler, just completely taking taking its toll. I love the um, the commentator saying, "Oh." Quite a few shots on the leg side, not many on the offside. <laughs> and also, what <laughs> hey, was look. that? What was what was that thing you were doing after you'd hit that first six? You were sort of holding your wrist or something. Got I mean, cramp, a bottom hand cramp. <laughs> oh, poor get thing! A, you poor never thing. Never going to get a much leading hand. Yeah, bottom hand cramp. So uh, look, hey, they bowled. They, they bowled in areas that were pretty good to me. As you can see, the, the dimensions of the ground were pretty small. Same boundaries. I saw a question come through actually while I was watching. Were they the same dimensions as uh, Inzamam al Haq and Javed Mandat in 1992? Yes, they were. Odd shaped ground, Eden Park. Yours, as you well know, Simon, you'll be there as well. So I was, I was actually at that game. Were you yeah. or not? I, well, I saw that innings live. Yeah, I was in the stand because I, my again. friend, I was playing for a Grafton that that, uh, yeah. that summer, and my friend actually his house backed onto Eden Park. So right. okay, yeah. So we we got in and, and watched it without paying of course so yeah it was it was cool uh, and we got out with a draw and we held this we won the series so uh it was good to contribute you know once you've been in trouble to that to that extent and get out of it so it, it sort of turned the match around and but it was and then uh, i think the next day um i think muhammad azaruddin who was captain i think came out and scorched a magnificent 192 he, he, so, he did i looked it yeah, up i'll tell you what though i mean let's just go back on it quickly i'm not going to play the whole thing but I mean, there's your wagon wheel, <laughs> yeah. which is, uh, well, actually, it was, I think the commentator was a bit unfair saying there was not many fours on the offside, although they looked a bit edgy, those fours on the offside, perhaps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lovely uh, old fashioned wagon wheel there, first days of the wagon wheel. But I, I, there was one shot here, I thought, that one you hit through the offside, um, not, yeah. not off the spinner, but off the, the seamer. See if I can just find it, um, that one there. Yeah. I can just go back a tiny bit more. I mean, one seri you know, seri seriously, bat speed here, bat speed. We talk about it a lot. Look at the wrists there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and what I love really? actually is the commentator saying, when you hit this, um, when you hit, oh, that's, that's coming over to my side, isn't it? I like, like to hit the odd one through, through the leg, even out from outside off. But th this, or oh, not this one, actually, there's a, I mean, that's a good shot, actually. That was your sort of trademark, was it? That pull? I was a bottom hand player, so most of them went in that, pretty much in that direction. Wasn't I, that short, the, that? No, a lot of sweep shots I used to play too, but uh, they say wicket keepers are very good square of the wicket, so uh, sweep shots. And um, I think one of the greatest of all time was Alan Knott, wasn't he? I mean, he was perhaps the best player of a sweep shot, maybe even still today. I mean, he was just a genius. He could sweep from anywhere, so. Yeah. Look, this this shot, the poor old the commentator said, um, that's the second best shot of the day. <laughs> that's a bit sort of damned with faint praise there, really. <laughs> hey, it was, as I said, it was, every dog has his day. It was, a, it, was, it was a lot of fun um, and it contributed to um, a decent day out. So, but I've had a, uh, I had a few zeros at Eden Park as well, but uh, thank God you haven't got the, uh, the no, highlights of those. No, I'm but, not going to uh, play those. No, oh, what, 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 what did you think of the commentary? The commentary, ironically, <laughs> one of the voices you heard predominantly there was Grant Nisbet. And Grant Nisbet is a um, leading rugby caller as well. And he and I worked together throughout the rugby, the rugby season still. And they, we went to the same school in Rongatai Ronga College in Wellington. So, you know, we, we've been pretty good mates over the years. So it was, it was interesting that he was able to call that. But, yeah, yeah, it was... Hey, look, it was... Both, as you, you know, the, they didn't have all the... The tools that we have in commentary these days, there's no telestrators, you know, they haven't got a, a screen up there with uh, runs on this side, runs on that side. It was all fed to you very, very manually back in those days, but now it's, it's fingertips. So uh, uh, they, were, they were iconic. Uh, funnily, to, to New Zealanders, that commentary team was, was quite iconic. Was it Jeremy Coney as well in it, I think? Uh, Jerry, I think, was maybe just gone into the commentary box here. John Morrison was there. Glenn mm. Turner was floating around, so yeah, there was some some pretty high powered stuff. That we, we, we thought anyway uh, in our day. Um, so you, you wanted to sort of want to stay on the good. Are you um, are you still mates with Paddles, Richard Hadley? Do you still see yeah. much of him? 
Absolutely, yeah. He's been he's had some bad health in the last few years. Of course, everyone would realise that. And uh, I've stayed in touch with him. I see him down when I'm down in Christchurch at cricket grounds. He still goes to Hagley Oval, and so I make I make a point of catching up. But uh, yeah, he I have um, I have seen uh, Richard Hadley a, a little bit more than I, I had actually over the years. But yeah, well, relatively small country, but you know. We've all gone all as like in England. A lot of people gravitate to the media or coaching or stay within the game. Uh, in New Zealand, you just branch off really, uh, and you go in different directions, and and you have different interests and, and vocations after playing the game. I mean, you've got to realise that when I when I played the game back in those days, Jos, for that Test match, I think I probably got uh, around about a hundred dollars a day, New Zealand dollars a day. So then that was quite good money back in 1990. They didn't pay you in lamb chops or anything. Yeah, no. Yeah, quite clearly. A half a beast. Yeah, I know you're getting around to that. But <laughs> I, I, I got a, about 100 bucks a day back in those days. So you, you weren't playing to live. You were playing to, to love, really. And, and how did the progression go from playing to commentary? How, what was the first sort of step? Well, I just, um, I, I always sort of, I'd always liked the, the thought of being a, a sports commentator, even while I was playing. So I always made myself available um, if they wanted a spokesman or if I was injured and they wanted someone or, or uh, to go in the commentary box and, and do a little bit of work. I always uh, was available to do those things. So when I finished playing at the end of the 92 World Cup, there was a vacancy in that, um, in that team, in that commentary team. And I, I basically walked off the field into the commentary box. So I was very, very lucky uh, that my opportunity came straight away. And, and you know, from that point onwards, um, I've, I've been doing it for, what, since 1992. So in various parts of the world. And, and you know, I've lived the dream life, to be lucky, to be fair. I've, I've been so lucky. Yeah, definitely. Should we talk about the World Cup final, Yoz? Yeah, I, <clears> let's, <throat> let's talk about the World Cup final. Um, Let's just, um, before we do, should we just see that bit of commentary again? What do you reckon? Or have you, you seen to, it too much? It's not going to change, is it? The result's not going to change, is it? <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, do you ever watch it back and think, is that did that really happen, any of that? I never watched it back. I, I, I have a, my own personal policy is I never really uh, look at commentary or I try to avoid replays in my sports, but certainly I, I don't... Um, I've looked, and I've been forced to because I've had to do the odd show like this and people have actually replayed it. And, um, and you're embarrassed, I just, are you? Yeah, look, no, I'm not embarrassed by it, but um, it, it was it, it's, it was different to how I normally would commentate um, a game of cricket. And I, I'm trying to, I've often tried to work out what got, what got me into that sort of mood and, and, you know, to stand up out of my seat, Bill Laurie like, and, and get right. And I think it was just the occasion. I think it was the atmosphere out the window, the, the, the beauty of Lords, and then just the, 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 the ups and downs, because normally commentary stints, as you well know, um, uh, last probably half an hour. So you're looking at six or seven overs of commentary, depending on what kind of bowler is bowling. And that commentary stint, because of uh, the time in between um, the extra over, uh, and uh, the, the post part of it as well, after it was all uh, said and done, I think it lasted about 80 minutes. It's a long time. Mm. to be up there, you know, to be up. So at the end of it, I was quite physically drained. I remember I was with Dooley and uh, Baz McCullum was there. He he went across to the New Zealand dressing room. He w walked across the Lords and went, he went into the New Zealand dressing room to offer his condolences and then, of course, he'd played with most of those guys. He hadn't been out of the team that long. So he was, Dooley and I just, we, um, we just sort of uh, put the suit jacket on and, and headed back over the road to, the Danubius, where we were staying, and um, and uh, the bar, the bar there was absolutely chocker full of people, and of course everyone wanted to have their opinion on why New Zealand had not been able to at least share it, and what were the rules, and so by the time you'd said the same story to about ten people, you, you, I was gone. Definitely. So I, I went upstairs and just lay on the bed for a while actually, um, and and just took it all in, and uh, I just I had no no knowledge of um, how people were going to react to, you know, the result or, you know, or the way we described it. I mean, you know, I got a lot of credit for it, but man, you, you've got to, and you will know that commentary, uh, my philosophy on commentary is this, is commentary, it's not a competition, it's a combination. It's 
It's not trying to outdo the guy in the seat next to you. It's, it's trying to work with the guy. And I, I, I was with Nass. Nass, fantastic commentator. He honestly, is he's a brilliant commentator. And the, 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 the bloke who I call the most balanced commentator in the world who, who can get high, he can stay low, but he is a great sort of uh, judge, if you like, who sits in the middle. And, and that's Ian Bishop. I, uh, Bishop's just fantastic to work with. He's got that beautiful West Indian accent. Uh, accent. But he, he, he just provides a nice, quiet little balance. You look at him and he's so calm. And so we had a nice mix in the commentary box. And after the, uh, after the normal time where it went into uh, the super over phase, I turned around to uh, the producer and I said, look, hey, you want someone else to come in? You know, we've had our 35, 40 minutes with you, you, you. And he said, no way, you guys, you're doing it as long as it goes. So we sort of turned around and away we went again. And uh, we had no idea. When I sat down there, I'd, I had no idea. Uh, that it was going to work out that way. Nothing prepared. You just go with it, man, and and, and it was just fantastic. Let's just, watch that little, let's just watch that little bit, and then yeah. we'll um, come back to it. Go on. Tell me to win. Gattel's going to push from Tony. They've got to go. It's got to has got to go to the keeper's end. He's got it. England have won the World Cup by the barest of margins. By the barest of all margins. Absolute ecstasy for England. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. My, my question was, who decides who's going to speak? You mentioned you had NASA there and you were there and Ian Bishop was there. Uh, how do you how is it, uh, explain to people how it's sort of divvied up? And OK, why so you, why in, you in the, all the moment. In, if you sort of yeah. And in a, in a, in a typical uh, commentary set up these days is generally three people working. Uh, one has the responsibility of calling the ball by ball action, which is what was my role for that particular uh, 30 minutes, supposedly 30 minutes of commentary. The next guy who's NASA sitting in the seat next year, he's the number one analyst in terms of uh, play by play. So as soon as you've called the action, then it's, it's NASA's turn to analyze it and, and as fewer words and as quickly as he can possibly do what he's just seen, why it's happened that way. Um, and what is the result of how it's going to happen. The third guy says very little except when you need a bit of balance or you need something more specific. And he might be working on something um, off camera, a little a package of play, a package of bowling or batting or field placings or a strategy that he can throw in on a quiet moment. Of course, in that scenario, we didn't have many quiet moments. The game was looking after itself. So Bish would just chip in every now and then you, you, you get the feeling you, you don't really even have to turn and sit to say well have you got anything to offer you can, if you get a relationship going and that's what I mean about a combination you, you can almost do it uh, without looking at the other guy you just sense that he's got something in there's a discipline in the commentary box which is not always observed but by and large if you've got nothing to say you put your microphone down and that's a signal that you've got and as soon as you go for your microphone that's a signal to the guys either side of you perhaps that you're ready to bring in something so you you, you sort of try and give that opportunity at the time but uh, the thing about uh, one day cricket of course uh, as opposed to test cricket one day cricket moves so quickly so much happens in a short space of time so you've got to be able to pick your moment and get in and get out quite quickly whereas in test match you can tell a story that might last for two or three overs. And, and uh, it's, it's a discipline. I, I mean, it's something, it, it takes time. I mean, I, as I said, I've been doing this now for uh, up until that World Cup final, about 26, 27 years. And I, I've been very, very lucky to, to work with the greatest of them all. Um, and, and whilst I never try to emulate um, Richie Benno, I, I looked at him a lot and listened to him a lot and, and just saw how he would, I would look out the window and, and mimic my own commentary and listen to what he was saying at the same time and it would be vastly different because he could say uh, things in the fewest possible words to make sense uh, than, than most other commentators could and that was one of his great strengths is that he could sum up situations in one sentence where it would take other people three, four, five sentences. Uh, I learned so much off him, I became a, a really good friend of his uh, when you're, we were at Channel 4, I think four or five, maybe six years in a row during the English summer, uh, we, we spent socially, we had a lot of dinners and that, and you find out so much about um, 
this guy. He was an absolute legend of a bloke. Uh, I think he was so highly revered in, in England. Uh, he never really got to commentate in New Zealand, which was a shame. Uh, but he he was so highly revered. I I got to I walked out of Lords one day uh, at the end of a a day's play in the Ashes, where I was a neutral commentator, and the, of course Lords was absolutely chocker. And I got the a feeling of just how revered Richie was because I mean it was almost impossible for him to leave the ground, um, yeah. and he but so nice with it, um, and very very sad. Um, <coughs> very sad. That he passed away. Do you know he um he had this. Um, habit of he knew that he'd get besieged by people wanting his autograph so he always had two bags and I said why do you have two bags and he said well he said um if I have a bag in each hand then I haven't got to get a, go to a pen and yeah. I can't sign any autographs so he would just when anyone asked for his autograph he'd just look at the two bags and walk on he wasn't being rude he just knew he'd get stuck for so long um yeah amazing man one of the things I've found interesting, actually, listening to television commentary sort of more these days, is actually there, there's the, there was the Richie style, which is, you talk, talked about it there, economy of words. But it seems to me on t television now that people are saying a lot more. Are producers mm. encouraging them to say a lot more than they they ever did in the past? I think so. I, I think so. You know, um, well, in radio, of course, um, it overlaps better than gap in radio because you you know you're just kind of constantly be uh, talking and, and provide something for the listener because they can't see what's going on uh and television there was the rule of thumb you know give them give the viewers credit for their own intelligence that they will actually just give them a space where they can make up their own mind about what they're seeing at the same time without crowding them with all this information but that is changing you're right uh, simon because uh, i think it's it's just the demand of of where the game is going. Um, the emphasis has gone on short forms of the game, and shorter it seems shorter every time. Um, and and T20, of course, the IPL is governed by action, action, action. And and it's it's the preference, I think, of, of Indian viewers in particular. They like that noise. They like that enthusiasm. They like it. Um, and, and that's the way you, your style of commentary to uh, to them. Um, whereas uh, older people, um, and I'm sure members of your club as well, like you know, who are absolute cricket enthusiasts, at times they, they prefer the, the laid-back English style, if you like, and I call it an English style because the English style is a lot quieter than the Australian style. Australian style is, is, is about, um, you know, pumping the game up, making sure the product looks good. Um, Australia doing well. There's a hint of the cheerleading about it in, at certain times. Um, and I think the New Zealand style or what we've tried to ad adopt here is, is, is closer to the English style, which is a little bit less wordy and a little bit more reflective. Have you had to change your style if you do, say, ICC events? Have you, you, yeah. you, you actually sort of, you go with your employer, basically. Yeah, you basically, you do. You, you go with the, um, the desire of the, of the producers. Um, uh, the employers, if you like, because they read it that uh, that's the kind of style that their predominance of, of their audience uh, wants to hear. So you, you do have to, you, you couldn't do a, a World Cup match and, and say, you know, very little in the, in the course of an over. You, you've still got to come up with theory and you've got to come up with something. Even, you know, the challenge is in some of those uh, one day matches that the result is painfully obvious a long way out. So one side might get rolled for 80 or 90 or 100, and the other side is none for 40 chasing. So how do you, uh, for those last 40 or 50 runs, where they're obviously going to win, make it entertaining for the people back home? And that, that is, that's a skill and a gift in itself. And unfortunately, you don't get too many of those games, but you do. And you can't, I mean, people aren't stupid. You can't um, stay with us. Anything could happen in this game. You know, it could, I mean, you know what's going to happen. But you've got to make it, try and make it as interesting as possible for, for the people at home without, you know, telling them that they're stupid. So it's, it's a real balance. And then you get one you know, every now and then you get one like a World Cup final, which um, you think, well, man, where did that come from? And what else can happen in this game? Is there anything possibly else that could, could happen? Is there... One of the, you know, the, the great sad thing about that, and you, you, you always have the ability to think about these things afterwards, was the rules and, and you know, it was a beautiful evening in London. 
why didn't they go again? People said, why didn't they go again? The crowd wasn't going anywhere. The television audience was growing by the second as people found out how close it was going to get. And all of a sudden, uh, you get to the situation where um, they knock it on the head and things are still the same. I mean, hey, I'm not moaning about the end result because the rules were the rules and New Zealand knew exactly what they were getting into. But I don't know if either of um, uh, Owen Morgan or Kane Williamson stood in their dressing rooms on the morning of that match at Lords and said to their players, look, just in case this match ends in a tie after the super over, make sure you hit lots of fours throughout the day. Yeah. I'm not sure either of them did that. Well, they certainly nobody told Mitchell Santner that because he ducked the last ball, the last ball of the innings, didn't he? I, uh, I, he's I mean, still it, living it, that. Yeah, of course he is. But it wouldn't have made any difference because it wasn't there wasn't enough boundaries. But uh, actually, we've had Mark Wood on this show, and and he actually said that they were, it was total chaos uh, at uh, the start when the Super over just before it when it had been announced. They had nobody knew the rules at all, and it was there were people searching for bats, and uh, I think Stokes borrowed somebody's box, and Butler was, you know, Jason Roy was throwing fruit everywhere. I mean, it was utter chaos. Do, do you ever um? Do, I mean, your commentary at the end has obviously become very attached to that final and that moment. Do you ever look back and think, where did that barest of all margins come from? I do. I, 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 don't, know where it, I don't know where it came from. I, I promise you. I mean, you can't plan for an outcome like that. So, you know, some people... I've seen guys with, uh, in commentary who have had exercise books with sayings. Mm. Um, I've seen people, you know cover off bases thinking well if it happens this way I'll say this or if it happens that way I'll say that but I can honestly say hand on heart I had uh, nothing prepared nothing written down and just I just went with the, the flow of the match and it, it, I don't know whether it was just years and years of doing that it, it, they, they, that phrase came to me or, or not I, I don't know well, I, you know as you could see from uh, one of the, the things that was interesting about that commentary is I was standing and, and I, I was doing that commentary a lot from out the window. And, and by and large, uh, to be fair, uh, it's, that's almost breaking the rules because what you should be doing when you're calling cricket action is calling it off the TV and the monitor in front of you because that's what the people at home can see. So it's no use me standing up there saying, well, that's a brilliant stop at Birdman or something if it's not there. I mean, you do it on radio because you're, you're trying to create the picture. I, 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 I've got a picture, which I, you know, I can only change when the director changes the picture. So, so I, I pretty much, I, I guess, broke, in, in terms of the actual rule book on, or if there is one on commentary, broke a, a bit of a rule, but I found it, uh, I just seemed to find it easier and glance down at the monitor. I, I sort of think when you're calling cricket, ball by ball you should be about a 90 10 90 percent off the monitor 10 percent out the window the guy sitting next to you who's analyzing i think he can be more like 50 50 he can because he can he can look at captains so quite often uh, a lot of the things that happen on a sports field of course uh, don't happen when the, you know when the camera's on you so traditionally in, in ball sports the camera follows the ball but there's a lot of things as you well know looking out the window you see captains making changes you, you see field is creeping in you see all sorts of things happen but unless you've got unless you've got a camera on it it's quite frustrating for the viewers at home because you know they, they can't see what you're doing so hey look it was just it just all okay. came I, I was lucky it came it came naturally and I, I think I had a vested interest of course New Zealand were in it um I, I would have loved New Zealand to win but that's not the not not really the way that you can portray such a magic event like that because I class myself as a, I'm not a New Zealand cricket commentator. In other words, I, I don't cheerlead for New Zealand. Um, I'm a commentator, cricket commentator from New Zealand. I'm a New Zealand voice and I, I live in New Zealand, but I, I'm there to commentate cricket. So you can't, you can't get yourself into the scenario where if New Zealand don't win, I'm going to be shitty about the whole deal and, and my commentary is going to reflect that. And it was, I, I, whilst your name is on the cup, the World Cup and, and good luck to you. I don't feel as if New Zealand lost on that day greatly. And, and I don't, uh, you know, the, the corniest ever phrase uh, in, in, in cricket is cricket was the winner. I mean, that's been around since WG Grace, I suppose. But here's the, the thing for me, and it, it was a winner that day because I'd be very, very surprised if more kids 
having watched that, didn't go out in their backyards on that evening and start playing cricket in the backyards with their mates in England because there's still a lot of light there and they would have liked to relive those moments. And back in New Zealand, I'm, I know it gave cricket a kick in the pants and more kids played there afterwards. So, and that, I mean, if you, if you have a, an event or a sporting occasion or anything that, that does that, if it, if it really encourages people to pick up a bat and have a go, Man, uh, you're on a hell of a winner there. So mm. I think that put, the way it was portrayed did that. Do you have you have a bit of a philosophy about coming to commentary, don't you? That you obviously there are a lot of things that happen in cricket the same each day or even each session, but you're trying to always find alternative ways of of, of describing it. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think you know you. You, you, you can get known for doing it a certain way or saying a, or having a pet phrase. Or, um, I've never tried to tried to do that. I, I think, you know, yeah, the other thing is I said, yeah, whilst I worked um, with Nasser Hussain and Ian Bishop for that particular commentary stint, throughout that, that match and throughout that World Cup, I worked with a lot of different combinations. I think in a, uh, I had an intriguing uh, session uh, when New Zealand were able to beat India in the semi-final in uh, Manchester, working with Sarev Ganguly, who I'd never worked with before. And Sarev is a totally different, uh, um, a very good in his own right and passionate about the game, of course. Um, but his technique is different to other people's technique. So, and, for, and so Sarev in that particular thing had his microphone to his mouth the whole time and there was only just the two of us working. It wasn't a three-person setup. Um, so you, you don't quite know whether he's going to say something or not. So it's... It's, I found that that was a little bit more difficult, but, you know, we got out of it because the game looked after itself and, and you're able to, um, to do that sort of thing. So in the course of a World Cup, you might work with in, a, in 15 different combinations with 20 different commentators, male and female. And, and, and a lot of the time you're working with them for the first time and you've got to get to know the way they do things. So I, I tend to sit back a bit and just see how things go. And if you've got a guy that wants to say a lot, let him go, but don't match him. Don't go matching him, um, you know, and just find a balance. It's so a, so if, you, balance. if you had some advice for a young commentator who's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, breaking out into radio or TV commentary, what, yep. what, would, what would it be? Okay. Uh, first thing is don't be over-prepared um, because it's, it's akin to playing the game. You really do not know what's going to happen. Uh, until that ball is bowled, so you, you, you can you can put, you look at you look at a game of cricket, which is a, and let's be fair, our game is governed by statistics, and there's millions and millions of statistics. But don't cloud your judgment by having them in your head. You've got a guy if you work in a commentary box, you'll generally have a statistician or someone who can help you out in those areas and feed you information, and and they deserve a lot of credit, those blokes as well, because they make you sound knowledgeable. And, and there's some wonderful ones uh, that I work with around the world and, and they're very much part of it. The, the thing is, don't be over-prepared. See if you can learn to say things in fewer words than you normally would. Um, and, and just try and, and just get the experience of what you're seeing on the TV or out the window or a combination of both. See if you can get that to the people at home. And, and that is, that's the secret to it really, because um, you know, the, most people that are watching it at home would perhaps, particularly you look at the World Cup final, would love to have been there. I mean, how many English people missed out on that occasion because there just weren't enough, enough seats? Um, so you, you, you owe them, you owe them um, the opportunity to live the moment without being there. So, yeah, I, I just, and, and, but the skill, uh, most cricket commentators that go in have come off the playing field these days. It's generally we're tending to go away from specialist broadcasters and we're going to ex-players and things. And they will have a strength in the game that people will expect that they will be able to uh, provide information for. Oh, yeah, you, you might have a new ball bowler. So you have a new ball bowler. You want him commentating when the ball is new at the start of the innings because that's the, the strength. And, and I think producers and that have got to look at those things when they, it, it, the perfect combination is a caller to start a test match, a caller, a top order batsman and an opening bowler. Then you've got the whole scenario covered uh, in that first six, seven overs, the new ball, how's it going to work? How's he going to use it? How's he going to defend it? How's he going to play it? What are his scoring options? Does he want to score? 
all those sorts of things. Uh, and they're the best people qualified. Then you bring in later in the day, you, you've got a, you look at um, st strategies. What's he going to do here? You'll invariably have a captain or someone close to captaincy in your commentary team as well. Bring them guys in. Sometimes I think commentary rosters, they put them on the wall for the day and you think, well, I think there's got to be a bit more flexibility. If I was producing, I'd say, actually, don't go too far away because they're going to take the new ball shortly or whatever. And I want you here for that 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if that's okay. So people go in and out of seats and, and you just try and cover that moment, that important moment in the game. Um, and I think mm. that's how the game will probably evolve at some stage. But my just live it, feel enthusiastic, find a, you know, a, a balance of words, uh, and, and use your experience to, to, to tell the people what's going on in players' minds. That's, that's your strength. And be nice to your co-commentators. Yeah, well, there is that. Um, there is that. I always, I, always, um, I always make a point of giving them the option, but if it turns nasty and there's a bit of banter, then I, I, I don't see any reason why you have to cop the lot. So I think you've got to get on the front foot. I mean, is that you, why you were always really horrible to me then? Well, it's, it's because, you know, it was various reasons why I was horrible to you. Most of them weren't cricket related, but, um, you know, you were, you were, you were quite handy um, uh, in the analyst role in, in Channel 4. I think you, you develop your own niche. You know, I mean, you are the analyst. I mean, there's no other analyst in cricket. So, I've got to I mean, bring this out again, haven't I? Look at that. Yeah, look at that. that looks yeah. like a person, actually, doesn't it? I can make a little... <laughs> it's, like, it's a bit like... That's like you. It looks like you, actually. I'll just, well, you know, thanks round much. face. Yeah, sorry, clearly, sorry. we're very clearly coming to the end of this program, aren't no, we? No, we're not. Well, listen, before we before we move on, um, I just want you know, obviously, a key thing is pronunciation. Mm. So, I want you to say these say these things, please. Six less sixty six. Well, or six four sixty six. Yeah. No, well, that's that's a minus sign. I I say ten for twenty two. I love it. Fish and chips. Oh, really? Not yeah. fucking chops. Fish and chips. I've what in honour of you today. I've worn this New Zealand T-shirt with all these phrases on it, like okay. you know, like like pack is sad and you know suck on the kumara and what's it <laughs> jandals for sandals and um, jandals mate. Look, jandals. You've got some jandals on, yeah. Yeah, jandals. Look, wogging is slogging, isn't it? Or is that no now gone out of wogging, fashion? Wogging was. Wogging was slogging, yeah, I was taking the long that's, handle. But that's probably, that's probably not a very uh, wise word to use nowadays, is it? No. No. Uh, what else is there? Go out in the wop wops? Wop wops, yeah, out in the country. There's all sorts yeah. of, yeah, well, we have chilli bins. What do, you, what do you call them? You know, your, your ice buckets with, where you put your beer in, what do you call those? Chilli bun. Chili buns, you call them, do you? <laughs> chilli bins, yeah, chilli bins. Chilli bins. <laughs> Love it. Oh, look, so, so go on, give us, the, give us the sort of the real kind of uh, country version of that. Oh, we, we, we talk in the country the way we, we, in fact, we don't have much of a change of X, you know, in England, you drive up the M1 and, and take a turn off there or turn off there and, and people, have, the dialect changes greatly. It's not, it's not, um, it's not that way in New Zealand. There's only 5 million of us live throughout this beautiful country and we don't right down the bottom of the south island they tend to roll their r's a wee bit the bit of a scottish background down there but um we, we man, I, 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 if i went out in the country i'd be talking the same way and they'd be talking the same way back so we we don't um have that kind of variation well, what i will say now is um our uh, our ancestral backgrounds are coming much more into new zealand now in other words um the Maori language is, is, is becoming very much prominent back in this country. It's called Tereo. And a lot of things, a lot of things that we do and we do on television that have a, a, a Maori translation underneath them. So that is becoming much more part of our culture. It's not going to affect me greatly because I'm closer to the end than the beginning, but you know, for kids growing up and going through the school system now, um, they're going to have to be, I won't say necessarily bilingual, but they're going to have to be, uh, very, very aware that the, the Maori culture and the, the Maori history is going to be very much a part of their life again. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. But before we go to the, the the audience questions, can you just tell everyone there's there's a lot of people on here who won't have seen Channel Four cricket because they're too young. Um, what did you used to say when it was time for my slot? 
pretend pretend you're about to hand down to me doing a piece from the truck. Oh, right. Yeah, I, I remember uh, we used to say things like, uh, now's a good time to go out and wash the car, or now's a good time to go and make a cup of tea, now's a good time uh, to take the dog for a walk because it's time for the analyst. Enjoy it if you can, we won't. Thank you. I, I just wanted to remind myself and everyone else what, what that was like working for, with you. Well, and then I get like... the sheep. Remember, I get the sheep out afterwards, and I've, I haven't got it anymore, but I get the sheep out and give it a little yeah. bar when I hand it back to you. Well, I, we also used to say, if you really want to learn something about the game, don't listen for the next 30 minute, three minutes or so, because you won't. Yeah, I'll leave it there then. <laughs> Shall we talk? So, oh, no, we've been not. We did not. You, you were late to Trent Bridge one day, were you? Okay. Oh, um, don't go there. Don't go there. Okay, right. Okay. No, don't, I mean, that's, well, you know, that was the Pete Stone thing. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to go there. Really. No, no. No. Okay. I'll tell that story another time. Um, that's anyway, it's about you, not me. So let's get into some... Or Simon, have you got... Sorry, I, I sort of... I've, no, no, it's fine. No, 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 it's time for, time for viewers' questions. Time definitely. for viewers' yeah. questions. Yeah, definitely. So we got... Uh, who's that? Jack. Jack Jones. Jack. Jack. Hello, Jack. Jack. Good, good to see you. And um, we haven't, I don't think we've seen you before, have we? No, no. Oh, well, so it's great nice to have to... you on and thank you for thank joining you and everything. And where are you? Looks like you're uh, in... I'm in London. Yeah. Oh, I'm, like in my, just, in the... I'm in studio flat. I've only got one room in, in my flat, sadly. Okay. So <laughs> this is me. Uh, okay. Thanks very much for speaking, Ian. It's an absolute pleasure to hear you, hear you speak. You're an absolute rock star, honestly. Um, I wanted to ask you about the current New Zealand team and in particular mm. Kane Williamson and ha basically how there's two parts of the question how much is New Zealand's recent success down to both the captaincy and also the individual performances of Kane and then secondly who do you think will be earmarked as potentially the day when when the day comes for him to retire to then take over that mantle because obviously there was McCullum really good captain Kane, really good captain. Who's next in line, do you think? Well, to answer your second question first, uh, is that uh, the guy in waiting is Tom Latham in Test cricket. At the, okay. I, I think he, he will be New Zealand's Test cricket captain. Uh, he will also probably be the one-day captain because he, he sort of fills a role in, in that as well. Uh, he's able to be the keeper batsman in that. He's a pretty talented cricketer, but he, he's been earmarked for leadership. So I think basically the New Zealand leader of cricket will be Tom Latham. Uh, how much is down to Kane Williamson? Uh, a lot. Uh, There's a hell of a lot. Not just his runs, um, but his presence. Uh, he's highly respected New Zealander, not New Zealand sportsman, a highly respected New Zealander. Um, and a lot of that came out of the World Cup and, and the fact that he, how he handled the situation, um, how he handled um, the stressful moments in that World Cup where he got New Zealand through. Uh, he was a wonderful player in that tournament. And I think um, he was given player of the tournament without winning um, because of the fact that the way he carried himself, the way he carried his team and, and the image he portrayed um, in terms of cricket. And that is Kane Williamson. You know, he, he, you never see him. Oh, I've known him for a long time. I've known him since he was a prolific run scorer as a kid. He's never been any any different. Uh, he's never heaped praise upon himself. He's He's been shy about talking about his own um, abilities, his own performance, because he believes it's about team. Um, and that is how his leadership is given. And, and he, he, he refuses to be put on a pedestal very, very reluctantly to do that. So that is Kane Williamson. He's had this amazing appetite for batting since uh, I, re I can recall him as an 11, 12 year old. He's just, he's, his reputation, very small country, was his reputation was huge there and everyone knew where he was headed. Uh, he's just, he's a cool, he's a cool character. He, he really is. He's not a big guy, but, uh, and he, he's, he's a, he does, he surfs, you know, he's a surfer. He lives by the beach in, in Mount Maunganui, a beautiful part of New Zealand. And he does, he does, you know, he's a family man now. He's just, he's, he, I won't say he's the perfect bloke, but it, I mean, he sees it from the outside. I'm sure there are Pretty bad Pretty close, things. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, uh, I'm, I'm sure he's probably had a hangover once or twice in his life, but he's, he just appears the, the great, perfect guy. So, you know, uh, Jack, it, it, we're lucky. Those kind of leaders don't pop up all the time. Um, we've had some a totally different character to Brendan McCullum. Man, totally different mm -hmm. character, but achieving the same results in a different way. 
Thank you so much. Oh, great. Well, Jack, thanks for joining and hope you'll join us next week for Monty. Uh, great to have you on. Uh, right. Is it Luke next? I think. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Luke. Hi. Hi. Uh, nice thanks for having you. me on. Not um, at all. Thank you for coming. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about commentary, really. And it's a bit of a two part. So I, I'm just thinking in my sort of lifetime, the iconic moments of commentary, obviously, you've got 2019, Ian Bishop, 2016 T20 World Cup final. And actually, Ian Bishop in the in the um, test series last week was amazing at the end. Um, and then sort of Ravi Shastri as well, 2011 World Cup final. Um, and it, you know, a lot of these iconic moments uh, are where the the passion of the commentator is. Like you were saying before, you had a, a vested interest in that final. And a lot of the the moments that I'm thinking of come when the commentator has that that vested interest in the moment, and it really seems to sort of, sort of uplift it, really. So sort of two parts to the, to the question. Why, why do you think that it enhances the moment so much? Um, and how hard is it to, to put that interest aside when you, you know, you, you've got your job as a commentator today? Yeah, well, I think it enhances the moment because it's important to enhance the moment because, you know, the game of cricket, if you watch a game of cricket, so much happens in a, in a, in a day and you, and so much, so many different scenarios come. I mean, look, you look at, for instance, Luke in the World Cup final. You look at that scenario where I think Guptill threw the ball, it came off Stokes' bat, and it went for four. I mean, there's so many things that happen in that 20 seconds that, I, for instance, I'd never commentated anything like that before in my life. And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't actually know the rule to the extent I should have. I don't think anyone did. <laughs> No. Well, the umpire's so, got it wrong for a start. I mean, enhancing the moment there is about describing what you're seeing. And then, you know, and basically saying, I don't, I, I think I said, I don't believe what I just saw because I didn't believe what I, I, I just saw because I hadn't seen it before and I didn't quite know. I mean, that ball, I didn't know that they had to cross to get an extra run or something before the throw was. I mean, that's totally, I mean, the umpires didn't know that for God's sake. And, and then, and then that ball actually, if you know Lords and you've been to Lords, that ball actually ran up the hill almost. So, mm. you know, and Colin de Gronholm was chasing after it. And, you know, he's not the quickest, but he's not the slowest. And he made no ground on that ball at all. And you think to yourself, <laughs> is that the telltale sign it's not going to be New Zealand's day? I mean, it was just like, so you enhance that and you think, well, my God, have I just seen that happen? Because I've just seen that happen. Um, so the, you know you you've got to, but it, it, it comes like it comes with um, doing the job for a long time. I'm I'm not sure you could do that in your first day of commentary. You might if you're extremely gifted be able to do it in your first day of commentary, but uh, enhancing the moment is is is, is the key to it really. It, it's the key to it. But I, I've got to let if I enhance the moment, like I've, I've got to be able to um, not cloud your judgment because you've got to absorb that moment and have your own opinion as a viewer sitting on your chair at home and that is the balance that is being able to find the way to describe it and then just sit back momentarily and for you to say yeah he's right or yeah he's wrong or I would have said it a different way or that's not the way I saw it and that is also the beauty of what's in cricket because your opinion will change I mean I, I might say you might be sitting at home looking at a passage of play and, and you'll be saying well why didn't you bring him on at that point and, and I might say, well, why didn't he bring someone else on? I mean, that's that's the beauty of cricket. We can all have a differing opinion on on the way we see it. Um, not so much the same in rugby or, or, or games that are only 80, 90 minutes long. It's just the moment goes. And it's a great reflective part of cricket. But it's just, I hope I've sort of answered your question. It's just finding, it's finding the words at the right time and, um, and hoping... You know, one of the beauties, Luca, of, of commentary, I've tried to uh, have a go at the past, is predicting what you think might happen, mm -hmm. not just talking about what did happen, because you can see that. So getting in a captain's mind and saying, right, what is he doing here? What, why has he put that guy back there? Or what has he, you know, what are they trying to achieve here? And then looking at a batsman and saying, he's going to hit it there. He's got to hit it there. And if it comes off, you, you, you feel like everyone thinks, what a hero. Gee, he knows the game, that guy. And if it doesn't, 
the very least thing you can say is I got that wrong, didn't I? You know, that I'm, I, 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 you know, he fooled me, and move on to the next one. So I, I think you've got to, you've got to have that balance, but you've got to have fun with what you do. I mean, it, it's your job, it's your job, and, and you've got to. And, and I think having a punt at what how you think things might eventuate is, is a huge part of that fun. And I, I try to encourage guys to do that. Amazing. I hope I Great answer. Fun. Yeah. Great answer. Okay, Luke, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, a brilliant question, actually. Uh, very well well worded. Jacob, hello. Good to see you. Are you, uh, are you on with us? No, I've got Umar. Oh, Umar. sorry. Umar. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm reading Jacob. Sorry, that's my fault. Sorry. Umar. What, apologies. Uh, hi, uh, great to speak to you. Uh, great voice, uh, also on the, on the rugby side. Um, we always think, in terms of chokers, it's these, these, these staffers who choke. I had a look. New Zealand have made six semi-finals and two finals. Do you think there's there's a choking choking element there? And second part of the question is, your '92 team was a very kind of uh, a bit of a, a new standard. You had the the Ospinner opening, you had a great match at the top of the order. Was that team better than the 2019 team? So there are two sort of questions. Yeah. Okay. Good questions too. Uh, look. Yeah, I think we do tend to choke in, in the big moment in cricket. Uh, we have over the years. Uh, not just in one-day cricket either. We, we've tended to, you know, we've tended to get ourselves in good position in test matches over the years, and not being able to follow through on, and, and get the results. So I think that is slightly, um, uh, slightly a, a, a situation in which New Zealand cricket has to has to try and deal with. It. And I think Brendan McCullum was one of the captains that, that tried to to knock that out of our system. Of course, and then we got to the World Cup final for the first time ever in Melbourne. He got out in the first over. And, you know, never, things didn't even eventuate to any degree in that particular game. So, I, I, and I don't think the fact that we didn't quite get over the line uh, at, at Lords will have helped that either because there were so many variables there. I mean, even in the last over. In that situation where Jimmy Neesham hit that six in that super over, I mean, we had to win from there. I mean, we had to. Everything was in our favour to win that game from there. We had to be the bookies' favourite at that point, and we couldn't get the job done. And we needed two to one. We got one and one point nine nine runs or whatever. You know, we just. So yes, I think I think that is. Um, I think that's a fact that we've got to win one shortly. They say you've got to lose one to to know how to win one. Well, we've lost two now. So I hope if we ever get to another one, we we will have uh, learned our lesson there. Ninety two side was a unique side to New Zealand conditions. We had what they described back there is dibbly dobbly bowlers. So we opened with a spinner. We had Gavin Larson, we had Rod Latham, we had Chris Harris, guys that bowled around about 120 kilometers per hour on very flat, low pitches and frustrated the hell out of everybody. And that's how we, we did so well in that tournament. As soon as we got on a green or, or a quick pitch against Pakistan, um, we were in trouble. And because we weren't used to playing on those against the pace that they had. This side, I think is a better equipped all-round side. Although, um, you know, there were players of that 92 side which would hose into this team. Mike Martin Crow, for instance, would, you know, absolutely hose into this team. So, you know, there were players who would have made that the team of today a better side. But I think this the, the side that you saw in the World Cup final at Lords, probably our, our best equipped one-day side, yeah. Actually, I mean, can I just pick up on that? I mean, um, it's a good question, Umar. Um, and hello, Jacob, as well. Uh, we'll come to you in a minute. Um, you could say New Zealand were chokers. On the other hand, you could say that you've actually constantly performed above your expectations or above everybody else's expectations. Small country, not that many professional players, keep getting to finals, and yet you haven't quite got the depth to overcome you know, the, the ultimate uh, obstacle, which is the final. So I suppose you could look at it two ways, really. You could. Um, we don't see that as overperforming, though. You can't. Uh, you, you you can't. You can't just say because you're small, you can't win. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, you, you look at how how soon into their cricketing history, in terms of big match occasions, did Sri Lanka win the World Cup? Mm. You know, I mean, you can't. Uh, so and they'd be I'll about the only one, though, wouldn't they? I mean, really. Yeah. I suppose West Indies early in the early days, but mm. I mean the the big the big cricket playing countries, Australia, India, obviously, and Pakistan have been the ones that have, have done it. Um, I don't know. I, I just think, I, I, funnily enough, I mean, just a bit of an aside, but just done a, a long interview today with Trevor Bayliss. And 
um, it's just a private conversation, but one of the things we talked about was England getting to number one in the world as a stepping stone to being the World Cup champions. And actually yeah. the fact that they sustained it over nearly 18 months as number one gave them the confidence to overcome those difficult situations. Whereas New Zealand tend to come from behind, you know, to win or, you know, slightly unexpected. They aren't number one in the world. Although ironically in test cricket, they I know they now are, but you know, generally you're you're coming from behind and sort of mm. doing incredibly well in tournaments, but not quite getting over the line. See, me, and that is Simon, man, that's exactly the point I make about Simon Hughes. You could have actually gone out and washed your car, right? Yeah. Or done the lawns <laughs> and the time it took for him to sum that moment up. Oh, it's just incredible. Jacob, <laughs> how are you, mate? <laughs> Jacob. Please answer you, ask your question and get me out of my misery. You're on mute, I think. Is Jacob on mute? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute there, yeah. Um, Ian, hi. It's, uh, hi. Hi, Simon, as well. Yeah, no, it's a great listen to you and, uh, yeah, very insightful. So my, my question is leading on from uh, what Umar said there. Obviously, uh, so many global semifinals, finals, um, and also, you know, what happened in Australia a year and a bit ago was a bit of a disappointment. New Zealand coming in, you thought they'll be, uh, they'll be well equipped to challenge Australia. But how do you see this World Test final going? Um, you know, with with the background, with the, uh, you know, I know it's different format uh, with a couple of World Cup finals. Do you see New Zealand actually cracking this? Uh, you well, know, this round? <laughs> They're going to have an advantage because uh, I think the way it's shaping up at the moment and, and we're talking um, a COVID friendly environment where uh, uh, things are able to proceed. Uh, they're going to have a bit of uh, match practice in England first with uh, test matches against England. So that'll prime them in that regard. Uh, look, I, conditions will be a huge factor and the opposition still hasn't been um, absolutely confirmed. But for my money, it's going to be India. That's the way I look at it. So how do you how do you beat England? What kind of conditions do you want uh, to play India and in, in England in the in the middle of June? So I'll be I'll throw my hands up and say we won't spin England out, uh, India out. We won't spin anyone out yeah. actually. We we have not got a recognised genuine spin bowler who's going to, in the second innings of a Test match win you a game. We haven't got one. Santana doesn't turn the ball. He's a nice flight bowler who works in white ball cricket, but he's not even a guarantee in our Test team. We really have not got a specialist test spinner who you could confidently say will bowl out a very powerful Indian batting lineup on the last afternoon, as England did uh, in the first test match. So look, um, conditions are going to be a huge factor. What New Zealand would like, I would think, just this far out, is they want a green pitch. Wherever that test is played, they want a green pitch and want to go hell for leather and compete. So Bolt, Saudi, Jamison, this new guy, Jamison, um, and, and we've got, of course, Neil Wagner in the wings. We've got a couple of others. They go head to head with uh, with Jasper Bumrah and Co, Mohammed Shami, and whoever's fit for India at that point. That's that's the way I see it shaping up. And if you can win that battle, uh, then you'll go a long way towards winning it. So for me, uh, you know, it's, what are we? We're sitting here in late February. Win the toss on a green pitch, bowl first, knock India over on the first day. That's the way I look at it. Get in a, a substantial enough lead, uh, and then you know, w winkle them out at the other end. But you won't be doing it with spin so uh, at the moment if the, if the pitch is dry um uh, dryish india with their undoubted spinning skill over new zealand would be my favorites and and there's the cricket commentator from new zealand as opposed to the new zealand cricket commentator summing that up jake jacob do you think it's unfair that if india get to the final they're not going to get any match practice um well, it, it, it is what it is, isn't it? Um, the, the calendar. Uh, mm. I mean, I mean, the the, the thing with the, the the Indian players is they're used to coming, um, you know, away from IPLs and playing in big Test series and things like that. It's just another um, another thing that they have to tackle. But I know India have gone to England in the past, haven't they, without any match practice, and they've absolutely flunked. Um, you, you know, so it could be an occasion where New Zealand could catch them off guard. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you no. Know? And just about the pitch, though, um, Ian and Simon, uh, who gets a say on that? Um, we ICC. Know what, it'll be ICC, mm -hmm. right? Interesting. Yeah. And what would it mean for New Zealand if you, if you won that World Test Championship final? Well, it would be big. I mean, it's the inaugural one, um, and it would be very big for New Zealand to be the world champions in cricket. At, at, you know, at some form of the game. So, I, I think everyone's fairly. Um, 
fairly also, I think people are, are fairly honest about their opinion. It's been very, very unusual World Test Championship being the inaugural mm. one. But, you know, if you look at the number of games certain teams have played, they had no chance of ever making it to the final. If you look at the scenario with COVID, et cetera, a lot of sides weren't never go, were never going to make it. New Zealand's been very lucky because we've been able to play sport in this country. Uh, and, of course, we've got a very, very good home record. A very hard side to beat at home because of the pitches that I just described for Jacob. Um, we make them to suit that. And we've knocked over a, a, an average sort of West Indies side, an average Pakistan side. Uh, and picked up maximum points along the way while no, no one else was playing, basically. So it, it, we're, we're quite lucky to get there, but you can only do what's put in front of you, and they've done that very, very well. So you can thank um, Jacinda and Hearn for being able to get to the World Championship final by, by, by the, the excellence of her policies, I think you can say. Now, here's a man who's an ultimate rival of yours. He, he comes from that other country, just across the Tasman, Scott who uh, was a leg spinner uh, contemporary with Shane Warren and is now a leg spin coach, has got a couple of questions for you. Evening, Scott. Good evening, Simon. Good evening, Ian. Nice to speak to you. Hey, Scott. Um, my questions, I've got two of them. The first one, um, if you are told that from tomorrow you could only accommodate on the All, bl all Blacks or the Black Caps, who would you choose and why? Okay, well... I like rugby. Um, I, lo I like the All Blacks. I love cricket. Uh, I, you know, I, I fell out of love with playing cricket, but I never fell out of love with cricket. Uh, and so I was able to stay in touch with the game and the people in the game through the commentary mode. Uh, the ultimate for me is commentating test cricket. Um, you know, whilst the World Cup final was, was fantastic and it was a great experience to be part of, give me a, an absorbing test match at a nice venue any day of the week. And I think it's still my passion. So for me, question one was very easy to answer, Scott. Uh, cricket, cricket. Well, except, except I will add this. If I knew for a fact we were gonna pump the living hell out of the Wallabies, then I'd quite enjoy that as well. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, this one's a bit more controversial because in our group, uh, we've got we've got the Folks Fan Club and we've got the Butler Fan Club. So uh, you being an independent international wicketkeeper, we we need your answer for this. So um, uh, the question is, if you were if it had to be Folks or it had to be Butler, who would it be and why? I'm a purist wicketkeeper. I'm from the old school, oh, um, you know, <laughs> where I still I still believe I still believe. Um, there's room for your best glove man in the team, even though he might score 10 less runs than the other bloke. So I, I, I've only seen <laughs> folks, I've only seen folks um, on that horribly turning dusty pitch the other day. And I've got to say his work was, was quite impeccable. So I'd, I'd like to see Ben folks, a lot more of Ben folks. And I've got a sneaking suspicion I'm going to. And I think, um, I think England uh, will use him a lot. I, I, he can clearly bat. I wouldn't got 50 not out on debut or, or close to that. So he can clearly bat. He can clearly do a role. And we might see that revolving door of Bearstow, Butler, Butler, Bearstow, Best finally uh, out, out for a while. And I think, folks, for me, Scott, any day of the week. So would you not play Thumbs Butler up. at all? Do I need to play Butler at the moment? Probably not. No. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't. But England's still got problems for me. I mean, you've still, you still really haven't sorted out your opening combination, have you, no, really? No. You, you still really haven't got that sorted. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, um, Ollie Pope looks a really talented Ian Bell type player, but you've got to deliver. So you, there's, there's issues there. Uh, quite mm -hmm. clearly, uh, Joe Root is back in the Fab Four for me. I mean, he, he mm -hmm. might have slipped out a lot of people's mind, but certainly he's, he's back in the Fab Four, Williamson, Root, Coley, uh, Steve Smith, uh, he's they're the fab four in batting and he's he's right back in there, Joe Root. Absolutely outstanding. So, and, and Stokes' place is, is undeniable. But there's still, for me, quite a few question marks about that English top six or seven. Mm. Hey, hello there. Nort's here. Simon, hello, Simon Nort. All going good. Have you got time for some more questions from the crowd or not? Have we got Sorry. time for some more questions, Stock Stockley? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, I'll just have to put the running shoes back on in another 10 minutes, Simon, that's all. All right, I'm bringing them. 
Scott, thanks for your question, by the way. Sorry we sort of dismissed you a little peremptorily there. Um, we can't have Aussies on for too long, though, really. Nah, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so who, who, who's next? Is it Alex? Um, no, it's... Ah, it's, um, oh, aha, it's Annie. <laughs> Hello, Annie. Why'd you say it like that? No, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, I know you try to be, pretend that you're intelligent with all these books behind you, but... No, it's just, I know it's just a backdrop. You try to pretend you played for Durham as well. <laughs> um, hello, Ian. How nice to Hi, meet, meet you. Um, okay, mine's a bit more about commentary. Um, mm -hmm. With the inclusion of uh, David Gower into the commentary team for the uh, <clears throat> Pakistan Super League, what route um, do you see um, the future of broadcasting going? Where do you think the onus is going to be on? Well, uh, I, I think um, I, I think you've got to look at, at um, I, I don't it's quite like playing actually, Annie. To be fair, I, I don't think everyone is ideally suited to commentate all three forms of the game. So you might get in a situation where you get um, you know, specialist T20 commentators, um, Lord specialists. Gower. Well, <laughs> no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Lord Gower's actually designed for T20 commentary, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed David's fantastic uh, Test match commentator, and you know, he's a great, great player, and, and you know, terrific, uh, terrific man. But um, I, I didn't see him going out of that uh, Sky commentary box into um, into T20 specialist commentary. No. <laughs> Uh, to be fair, so and especially uh, not I in think, Pakistan either. No, especially not in <laughs> Pakistan. But I, I think you know people will take you know it's a very very um, competitive industry commentary. Mm. You know yeah. it's like man, you 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 hear a, a new voice and you think who's that, and all of a sudden it's a guy that's just retired and he's just gone back and straight out and into the commentary box. It's so competitive. It's such a uh, and the reason why and he is it's such a great job. Uh, uh, to be honest, it is it's a privileged job to be able to stay in touch with the game that you, you know, you love and, and make a living at it. And, and, and to be honest, it's quite a good living. And you, you, you get well looked after. I mean, who wouldn't want to do the job? But, it, you, you, and you stay, you try to hang in there as long as possible, but it's very dog eat dog, um, you know, and, and you've got to build relationships with producers and television companies and, and hope like heck that the phone will ring. It's, it's, it's like, um, it's, it is a really tough, it's a tough gig to, to absolutely rely on, but, uh, I, I, I see it going that way. I, I see because of the predominance now of T20 cricket that you're going to get your, your song and dance men that are, are going to really dominate in that particular area. And then you'll get your more laid back sort of uh, older blokes or, or guys who are prepared to be more analytical and patient about things mm -hmm. uh, become specialists in that form of the game. So, you know, Atherton, yeah, Atherton, for instance. Atherton, mm -hmm. Atherton. Uh, wonderful analyst at test match level, fantastic. But uh, I don't see Atherton getting off his lazy butt to do T20 cricket too enthusiastically from time to time. Um, so, you know, I, 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 you look at Atherton's scenario to uh, Danny Morrison, which is the absolute extreme. I mean, would you like to see Danny Morrison in a test match commentary no. team? No. But, you know, if you want entertainment and you want bizarre, and you want out and out fun, I guess, uh, you're going to get that from Danny Morrison and White Ball T20 Cricket. So that's why I see it. And I think specialists in the game, specialists in one particular form of the game, and I think everyone will be better for that. What about you, Annie? What do Because Annie's a, a commentator as well. What do you mm -hmm. think, Annie? What, what, what do you think is the future of it? Well, I, I'm with Ian very much, actually. I think it is going that way very much. So... Um, but our commentary just does, does everything we possibly can. So, <laughs> but we don't get paid for it. Not like uh, not like uh, you guys. So you're a triple format specialist. Yeah. Well, I, I always just do test matches as much as I can. But um, okay. I, I do the odd um, T20 thing. Okay. It's quite hard actually. Teach. I think. I think particularly, funnily enough, for a writer, T20 is really hard. I think it's mm. for journalists. You know, tests give you so much more scope, whereas T20, you just feel you're trying to make stuff up almost. You're trying to yeah. almost impart uh, things that have happened, which probably haven't happened. Um, Ian, you're, you're joining us. Thank you for your support, your endless and 
um, un, un, undisputed, what's the word, uh, passionate support. Um, the floor's yours. Thank you, Simon. Um, Ian, hi, and great to have you with us. Um, Simon actually borrowed my question earlier, so I'm going to improvise one in the spirit of uh, the creativity we've heard about tonight. Um, of the current crop of cricket writers, as opposed mm -hmm. to commentators, who do you enjoy reading yourself and, and why? Interesting. Um, or, um, when I played, I'll be honest, when I played, I, I didn't like cricket right as much. <laughs> um, now, that, now that I've jumped the fence, I, I, I have uh, admiration for, uh, and I'm not because we're going predominantly into England here. Uh, I think English cricket writers are very, very good. Um, and, and, uh, and I mean, uh, you get a guy like Athers, for instance, you know, Michael Atherton, who's extremely well-educated young man or older man now, but he, you know, he, he's very, he's very talented uh, and he gives you the best of both worlds because he gives you playing experience, leadership experience, and the ability to put that into words, which not a lot of people can do. Uh, written words um, and find make it entertaining and opinionated and I like opinions you know Ian I, I like you know I know what the score is um, you know I, I, I know how such and such got out but I love opinion pieces on cricket and that the other, and you get a lot of that in England and without trying to single out too many people you, you just the other ones that, that I like and they're quite often they're not um, experienced cricket people you know I used to en enjoy reading um, Derek Pringle, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know those kinds of guys, and uh, and then you you get the, the ones that are ghosted, clearly ghosted, uh, because they're big names, and they have a a really average sort of article coming through that's ghosted by some guy, but it's because it's him, you know, that that people want to read it. Uh, I, I, is it a lot? Is it a, a losing art? I, I certainly hope not, Ian. I, you know. Uh, you know, with the way of um, with the way of television dominating things these days, um, and people, you know, uh, are they satisfied that what they've seen on television is enough? Do they need to read the paper tomorrow morning? Is that a worry? Do younger people? Uh, I'm 63, nearly 64. I mean, but do 24 year olds read the paper about cricket? I don't know. Do they do they do that? They go out and buy a paper like we used to to right. get. I don't know, Ian, and that's, to me, is, is that a worry? I, I think it is, as traditionalists, I think it is a worry. Because I think it's a question of whether you can get good long-form writing. So Gideon yeah. Hay, somebody I always look to. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah in absolutely. Long things. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Um, and, and, and not generally not people with massive um, cricketing playing backgrounds who uh -huh. but, but have lived the game from a young age and, and, and feel as if they know it with that kind of background and I, 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 I as I said I, I don't want to sing but there's been guys who have been traveling the world for a long 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 time um, you know some of them with not great incomes and that because they have a, an absolute passion for cricket and describing cricket so uh, I, I hope there's still I hope there's still room for it I hope there's still room for uh, broadcasters on radio and television who are, are professional broadcasters um, particularly in radio the yeah. skill of broadcasting on radio, which I've only dabbled in, uh, is completely different to television. And you have to be very professional as a wordsmith to be able to do that. Yeah, Simon Mann made a really good point one of the earlier evenings about the difference between the, the ex-player commentator and the, the presentation of an event, um, which I thought was a really key point. Yeah, absolutely. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Great. Cheers, yeah. uh, do you. you remember? Um, do you remember we used to laugh slightly meanly at times when Richie Benno wrote his column because he had a column in the yeah. News of the World and it was nine hundred words originally and it was like the voice of cricket, you know. And he'd be labouring, slavering away all afternoon on Saturday, wouldn't he? Writing his six hundred, seven hundred words, and by the end of his. <laughs> By the end, it was like cut down to 60 words in a tiny little top corner, but he still wrote 600 and they had to edit it down. <laughs> you reckon he got paid? Uh, probably. Well, what, yeah, as, as if he'd done 600, a, you mean? Yeah, but you don't want all your words cut down, really. Anyway. Geez, I, I, we just got Martin on screen. I thought for a fleeting second it was Bumble. Oh, yes. bit, oh, look a bit very like similar. Bumble. They do look very similar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shadowy there, Martin. Are you, are you on mute or not? I think you might be on mute. 
Um, I think Martin's on mute. Well, Martin. Martin sorts of technology. I will say Bumble is one of those unique people who yeah. can do yes. all three forms. He is unique. And, you know, if you watch Bumble commentate, it's a real joy. Uh, uh, and it's all, his, oh. his presence in the commentary box is infectious. Mm. And, Martin's and with us now. If you oh, can't yeah. have fun, Good point. if you can't have fun commentating with Bumble, then you're uh, you're probably better off to go and get a bucket and spade and go to Brighton Beach and pick up stones. <laughs> Martin, we can hear you now. Uh, yes, hello. I, hello there. Thanks for having me on again. And no, say a great pleasure, pleasure. Again, Ian. Um, some great points you've made. Uh, unfortunately, my thunder has been sort of stolen, really, by a lot of other people. But my question was, you mentioned that you're a, a New Zealander who commentates on cricket rather than being of a passionate New Zealand cricket sort of fan. Um, but underneath that professionalism in, in the World Cup final super over, when Nisham hit that six, did that New Zealander come out and say, yes, we've won this? Or did you have to stay professional and think, I can't even go there? Or did well, you not have I'll, time? <laughs> I'll let you into a secret here, mate. And I, I did think at that point that New Zealand were going to be the World Cup champions, right? And, and I... I thought well, this is the most unlikely thing I've, I'll ever describe in my life. But um, a part of me also said, have we not seen enough toing and froing in this game? Is the worm going to turn again? Mm. So we um, there was a bit holding back. But at that moment when that ball whistled into the crowd, I thought, how can we not win this? Because uh, we were so far ahead of the ask. I will also let you in on the fact that on my right shoulder, out of vision, was a fellow by the name of Brendan McCullum, who was standing watching this unfold with the most beautiful view in the world of cricket, was in that press box looking down. So he's standing just out of shot. It's a pity they didn't have a camera on him because he was living the game from a New Zealand point of view, having been in that team with most of those guys not long ago. He was living it a different way than I was living it. So... Um, I turn around and and he's beaming, absolutely beaming because he and he's basically said to me, "We've got this, we've got this, we've got this." And he's you know, and then a minute or two later, a minute or two later, when the game had turned again, he had turned. I mean, I, I probably didn't even have to look out the window. I could have looked at Brennan McCullen's face to see how the over was unfolding. And then when we needed two off the last ball to be the world champions, he said to me. Guppy's got this. Don't worry. Guppy's got this. Because everything had gone wrong for Martin Guptill in that mm -hmm. tournament up until that point. This is Guppy's moment. Guppy's a great guy. And Guppy's a fine player. And Guppy's got this. So he's I'm trying to talk to you. He's talking to me. Nass is looking at him. And Bish is looking at him. And Brendan McCullum's sort of living this moment um, out of shot. Uh, and of course, at the end of it, we were that far short. And, uh, and he just slumped down. And, and it was just like, uh, but he, uh, he, was, he was more recently in the side um, and he knew the emotions of those, those guys that were on that field. Yeah. And of course, being the captain in a losing final as well, um, he, he, he was itching that New Zealand could uh, right the wrongs of Melbourne three or four years earlier. Hey, look, um, yeah, but it was um, yeah, when the six, when Nisham hit the six, I was quietly confident, Martin, quietly yeah. confident. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Um, brilliant question. Um, let's. I think we'll do the quiz now, Simon. Um, you think, is that is that good? Good plan? I think so. Yeah. This is this uh, is the last thing. This is the last thing we do, Ian. You'll yeah. Be, this is the last thing we do. Um, be, so apologies to Will and uh, Richard. Um, we'll we'll maybe not have time for your questions, but I know you've asked lots over the the last few weeks. So I hope you'll excuse us. Uh, we've kept uh, Stockley a long time already. He's desperate to get out for a run. So, this, this, this will not part, take long. This part is a quick little round of 10 questions. Yep. Um, it's the title of this little slot is How Well Do You Know Yourself? Yep. Um, the This is the leaderboard. I'm just going to show you uh, here. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, so Strauss, nine points. Strauss is on top. Yeah. Beefy, did, Beefy did surprisingly well. Mm. Yeah. Um, before Christmas, we had Alistair Cook, and he actually only managed four. Okay. So four okay. is kind of the one to beat, really. Yeah. Um, it starts with a bit of music. Yeah. Yeah. 
got 10 questions and what's really good is that you have been on this show every week because the buzzer for when you get the right answer is this. He's got it! <laughs> so you've been on this every week. Uh, if you get the wrong answer, <laughs> is that. Okay. Righty up. Okay. Okay. So 10 yep. questions, uh, seven to beat, uh, if, if you like. And the, the clock starts now, Simon. Okay. How many wicket keeping dismissals did you make in your first test? My first test, uh, the Gabba, one. What was the nature of it? Hold on. What was the nature of it? Oh. I, I, oh, I caught, I caught, I, uh, geez, did I, did I catch um, David Boone? No. No, okay. There was a run, there was a run out. Um, yeah, at Valen Border, you might have been involved in that. So no, uh, that, was, that doesn't count. That's no, wrong, that doesn't, doesn't wrong wrong count. Answer. It's the wrong. It's the wrong answer. Yeah, it was no. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. I can't get maximum then. Okay. Which the question two? Which two bowlers dismissed you most in Test cricket? Just get one of oh the of the two people. God. Um. Ah, uh, God, man. Um, take your pick. They both did it four times each. Four times happened. each? Yeah. Uh, both of them. Sorry, and both of them. No, okay. I'm afraid not. Malcolm oh, Marshall and Capel Dev, you could have had. Oh, Malcolm Marshall. Oh, Capel Dev got me. Okay. Malcolm Marshall. Four times yeah. each. Four times yeah. each. Malcolm Marshall love bowling to me. Yeah. Oh, dear. Not out of two. Question number three. Yeah. Um, you made three one-day international half centuries. Yeah. Name, name the three venues you scored them at. Okay. Uh, Eden Park, Basin Reserve, and... I'll give you a clue. It was against, it was against Pakistan in 1984. Um, that would have been at Lahore. I think what are we going to do here, Yoz? I think it's half a point, isn't it, for this? I, I think we'll give him a point for this because yeah, okay. he got the right country at least. I mean, he got <laughs> the in the right country and he got the other two. So we'll give you. It's actually it was actually where was it, Simon? It was in Peshawar. Oh God, can't get much more northern than that, no, can you? you? Can't. You but can't. we'll give you give you a point for that because you got the other okay. two. Okay. Just to get you going. Right. Yeah. Question four. So you've got one out of three so far. Question four. How many runs did England need off the final over of the World Cup to win the match? Ah, uh, right. England. England didn't have the final over. Oh, the final over over of the World Cup proper. Of the final, before the super over. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, right. I think they needed 11. Fifteen. Was it fifteen? Yeah. Well, if you remember, uh, uh, the Jimmy Neeson hit a six, and then yeah. it was down to seven. That's right. And they got no, a no, two. No, 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 no. We're talking, no, we're talking, about, we're talking about the oh. final over yards. The final over was just Stokes was batting. He sorry, hit sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. And then there was a six off sorry. the bat. Remember the the, yeah. the, the, the dive yeah. to make the crease. So there was yeah, yeah there were two sixes sorry. in the final over. Yeah. So that was the over. Anyway, number five. Um, Good so that's God, four, this is one terrible. out of four so far. Uh, Alistair Cook, he's he's um oh, Happy. Let's see what let's see what happens. Uh, question number five. This is you must be able to get this, Smithy. Who was your first stumping victim in Test cricket? Oh, God. <laughs> this is 1980, 81. It's 1980. 80, this is England. It's England. It's, it's England. against England in 1984. Your first stumping victim. That was at um that that was at uh 1984, so yeah, that was a team of uh, Graham Fowler, uh, Taveray. It was I off think. Stephen Bock. Yeah. It was at Auckland. Yeah. Was it Was it Bob Taylor? Oh, well done. He's got it! Bob Taylor, yep. Yeah. Two out of five. Yeah. Okay, question six. How many overs have you bowled in Test cricket? 
three. He's got it! Uh, Very good. Against? West Indies. And what Great the hell story. Have you got, have you got a minute? I can tell yeah. you. Martin Crowe uh, had never, he'd done everything in, in test cricket, open the bowling, open the batting, a hundreds, you know, world-class player. But he never wicket kept in test cricket. So we're at Sabina Park in Jamaica and the West Indies uh, requiring not many to win the fourth test. And he said, can I work a key? I said, well, you've got to clear it with the captain and Jeff Howitz is captain. He said, yeah, why not? You spoiled brat, you've done everything else. So uh, like, so he, he put my gear on and um, I, I was allowed to bowl because uh, they needed naff, uh, they needed naff all to win really. So we made a pact in the team that Martin Crowe wouldn't touch the ball, right? So to do that, I had to have average bowlers who wouldn't beat the bat. So I was allowed to bowl, and I think John Bracewell bowled at the other end as a spinner. And <laughs> we had to go, we had to make an agreement, and Greenwich and Haynes, who are fair players, uh, Gordon Greenwich and Desmond Haynes, we, we went to them and said, look, this is what's happening. Don't leave the ball alone, and so it won't go through to the keeper. Uh, just play everything and so we actually did that and he never touched the ball and he finally twigged that things were going that way when the ball was worked down to fine leg fine leg through it to the bowler's end and so he's standing over the stumps at the keeper's end so he never got, he never got to touch the ball and it took him a long time to work out what was going on but uh, Greenwich and Haynes played it beautifully and, and of course we, I was never going to beat the bat anyway so uh, it just worked out well and I always tell people I bowled to Greenwich and Haynes which is not to, a bad combination for my only mm. bowling test cricket but yeah three overs and, and Martin Crowe never, never touched the ball what did, you, what did you bowl? Did you bowl? Oh, I just bowled little medium paces laws like you mm, Thanks Yeah right <laughs> yeah. God. Ladies and gentlemen this is, elite, this is elite international sport we're talking about here <laughs> Yeah yeah and who's about someone not touching the ball? Anyway, question three out of six. Seven. Three out of six. Well done. Yeah. Question number seven. Question seven. Who has more single figure test scores, you or Nasser Hussein? Nasser Hussein. He's got it. Very good. Liam Smith, and, 22. Nasser Hussein, 28. And aren't I happy about that? <laughs> I thought you might be. Okay. Uh, question. So that's five. That's four out of seven. Yeah. Yeah. So question eight. Now here's a good one. Who has a better ODI strike rate? You or Adam Gilchrist? Me. You sure? At one stage, that? I think. At one stage, I think I was third. Second or second to Viv Richards. He's got it. Yeah. You are absolutely like correct. I had luck, Alistair Cook. <laughs> Sir Alistair. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. You've, got, you've gone past Alistair Cook with that answer because the answer is um, Adam Gilchrist had a strike rate of 96.94. Ian Smith, 99.43. Mm. Yeah. And that was in the 80s and 90s. So He might have got a few more runs than me, but that was strike rate yeah. we're talking about. So yeah. He played a few more games. Yeah. Question number nine. This is this is very much a Yozza question. How many sheep are there in New Zealand to the tip to the nearest ten million? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when, <laughs> depends because it depends. This changes from uh, month to month because they kill a lot and we eat a lot. Um, okay, to the nearest ten million, I'd say there's sixty million sheep. It's not the answer I got on my paper here. Um, Yoz has done the research on this. He reckons there are 27 million sheep in New Zealand. You're living in the past, mate. Used to be 70 million. Yeah. 50 million of them are dead. Or 40 you million. Went out with a, you went out with a few of them, you'd know. <laughs> I did, actually. You're absolutely right there. <laughs> Bloody hell. Yeah. Um, God. There's a, there's a memory. Right. So that's four out of nine, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. So your last question. Um, I think I'm five. I think five. No, you're five. five. Yeah, five out, five out of nine. nine. Five okay, out five out of nine. Right, yeah. fine. Last question. On Sky, what do Athers and NASA affectionately refer to you as? Uh, 
Beaky and creaky. What do they call yeah, you? That, be that beaky and creaky is 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 huge nose and Atherton's bad body. Uh, beaky and creaky. Um, what am I? Uh, I know when they when they used to have that. Uh, third man position we used to do that uh, position on uh, at one stage I was uh, we'll throw you to wide third man so he's got it <laughs> you got it <laughs> the widest third man in world cricket <laughs> well, there you go you six. got six out of ten not bad not bad <laughs> which still puts you bottom of the current table oh okay thanks that's all right. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, you need to sort of mug up on your history a little bit, really. Well, I don't really, I, I don't really like to, like, unlike some people, I don't like to well, dwell yeah. on my own career, Mr. Mm -hmm. Diamond. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, that we're done, really, aren't we? Um, final question, Simon. You got a, a, like a sort of, you know, killer question to finish with? Ah. Uh. No, I haven't actually. <laughs> you, you put, you put well, me on the back foot. Oh, with sorry, that sorry. Um, I mean, I, I'd just like to to say, what is it about New Zealand sport that makes them so good? Yeah, well, look, um, I think uh, we, we've had a very good yardstick in our sport over the years, and it's it's the All Blacks, and you know they've set a very very high standard in terms of their win-loss ratio, particularly lately, actually, they've been phenomenally good. Uh, but they've always been numero uno, um, you know, as opposed to trying to support the English football team. Uh, the All Blacks actually got a, quite a good record. So uh, we can gauge ourselves against that and try to lift your standards. We've also had a number of very good individuals at, at things like the Olympics. The sports that we are very, very strong in, We've always had good rowers. We've always had uh, good sailors. Uh, so, but it's, I think it's the opportunities that we get as kids, you know, uh, the facilities and, and the opportunities to be good and uh, be encouraged to be good. And we're an outdoors country as well. You know, we, we spend a lot of time outdoors and, and, and doing things out, outdoors. I mean, the world's changing and a lot of kids now around the world are living on computers and, and the internet, and, and that is not a good thing for for um, sport and health and those sorts of things. I appreciate the need for it, but um, uh, and New Zealanders have tended to to take part. We, 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 we like to get involved and take part. And I, I don't know, I suppose, I suppose there's something in our DNA that um, we enjoy being the underdog and, and fighting fighting from that position. So, and in most things we are the underdog, except for rugby, really, we're, we're generally speaking. And is that I mean, is it the, is it the legacy of of the world, the All Blacks? Because anyway, I mean, when you talk to I mean, England cricket, you know, just quickly, England's cricket took a leaf out of New Zealand the way they played, and yeah. New Zealand cricket probably were influenced by the All Blacks and their supremacy and their they've got these kind of mantras, these philosophies like uh, clean the sheds and you know no dickhead policy and all that sort of stuff, and it's become a very universal global thing, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, the All Blacks, <clears throat> I think the All Blacks are one of the top three or four recognised sports brands in the world, sports franchises in the world. I think Manchester United might be right up there and maybe the Yankees. Um, but I think the All, All Blacks are right up there. Uh, and, and, you know, so, I mean, when, you, when you're born into New Zealand life as a young kid, generally speaking, uh, I'd say eight out of ten want to be an All Black. Um, and, you know, one out of 10,000 becomes one. So yeah, we find other activities and uh, look, they're still the they're still the yardstick. They're still a sporting team that, that rates the best on television. Um, you know, when, when the Black Caps are doing well and they look like they might have an unlikely victory, people tend to tune in, but not to the same extent that you'll get for a, an All Black Test match against a quality opposition. So, I think the All Blacks, are, uh, in terms of sport, are, are, are largely uh, responsible for the desire to do well. And then, of course, you get onto a world stage and you just back yourself. I mean, one of the most unlikely results for New Zealand sport in the history, in our history, was to go to a football World Cup. We've only been to two or three at the most, maybe only two World Cup finals, and to remain unbeaten. You know, that, to me, that that surpasses a lot of things that the All Blacks have ever done or New Zealand cricket. I mean, imagine lowly. I mean, you play 
football in New Zealand, if you play football in New Zealand domestically, if, if you make make a two thousand, three thousand dollars uh, a season domestically, you're you're doing pretty well just to pay for your boots and things. So, you know, we pay ground fees and things like that. Your son was a footballer, wasn't he? Or is, is a footballer? Your son mm. went to your son went to play football in in the states, didn't he? Oh, he, he he went through the college system. Yeah, he was at West Virginia University, and then he was signed by uh, Toronto, and then he went across to play for Seattle Sounders. Uh, when he played for Toronto, his greatest claim to fame, uh, Jared, this we're talking about, is uh, he he scored the winner in a three-two win over the Galaxy, and David Beckham was playing for the Galaxy, so uh, he scored the winner. He also played for New Zealand when they lost five uh, 0 to Brazil. And that we thought was a pretty good result. And uh, he came on with about 35 minutes to go. And he was marked by Roberto Carlos. And Kaka played in that game. And so, I mean, he, you know, he reached heights in, in football that I, I couldn't reach in cricket. But uh, he, it's been good, you know. And he, he's, that was great to live, live through that. So, we always had a passion for football. But uh, no, no, that, that, uh, hey, in all, mate, I, I've been very lucky. I wouldn't. You know the old expression, would you trade your life for anything? I, I, I genuinely don't think that I would, you know? Lucky. That's a, that's a lovely uh, lovely mm. thing to, to say at the end. That's really mm. lovely. Okay, been, well, yeah, I know we've got to, we don't want to stop you. We don't want to stop you from getting out there and doing your daily yeah. exercise. That's all right. You know, you know I'll do it with passion as well. <laughs> I can tell you it's, it's, it's 15 well, metres... No, so it's it's the outside. To, no, it's 15 metres to the, the bench in the fridge and I've got an omelette waiting. <laughs> Brilliant to have you on, Ian. Actually fantastic. Great insights. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Simon. The yeah. sensible Simon. Very good. Excellent. Enjoyed it. Excellent. Good. Thank you, guys. I'm glad you did. Right. All the best. Little, but one, one little to note for your diary. If you can keep mm -hmm. a, a spot next week free, not for this... But we want to talk to you about the World Cup documentary. So, uh, uh, which day is your golf day? Which day are you kind of at home? Uh, golf's Thursday afternoon, New Zealand time. So, um, so this yeah. time is this time's a good time for you, is it? Not too bad. Yeah, Friday mornings. Yeah, yeah, not okay. too bad. Right, date is next Friday morning. Then I'll I'll okay. confirm it with you. Good Many you thanks. Guys. Anyway, have Thank a great you. morning, and it's been just wonderful having you on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Shame about the quiz. <laughs> yeah, well, shame about your hairline. Oh, well, you know, got to live with some things, haven't we? At least I haven't gone grey <laughs> or white. <laughs> you should have. Oh, maybe. I could always colour it. I'll colour my head, maybe. <laughs> Just put a bag over it. That'll do everyone a favour. <laughs> See you, mate. Lo lovely yeah. to be with you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Leaving. Can't get rid of him. Bloody hell. I don't think he knows how to turn it off. Does he? he doesn't. <laughs> oh, he's gone. Thank yeah. God for that.